Hey everyone, we're here for the first episode of the Whirling Circles podcast. Um, we're really excited to finally get this podcast going. Um, you know, for those who know who Frank is and the Wudang, I know you all have been very excited about uh, hearing this podcast and the idea of its formation has been exciting for everybody. So we're glad to finally get it going. Um, before we get into introducing Frank, a quick introduction of who I am. My name is Sean Garcia. I'll be the host uh, for the Whirling Circles Internal Martial Arts Podcast. And my background is uh, I've been a martial artist basically my whole adult life. I'm a recent student uh, with Frank in his uh, Wudang school in New York City. And I'm also a podcast producer. And after a few months of training with Frank and uh, you know, sitting down and hearing Frank talk and, and him sharing his knowledge on martial arts and other things in the world, um, I just realized very quickly that I wanted to see if we could document uh, his oral history and start getting more of his, his information and, and, and the folks that he knows about getting it more into this uh, world of podcasts. So we're very excited to bring you all this, uh, this show. So Frank, without further ado, um, just give us a quick introduction of, you know, who you are and how'd you get into martial arts? Um, I'm Frank Allen. I'm the director of the Wudang Physical Culture Association. We've been around since 1979. Um, I got into the martial arts actually relatively late for formal study. I was 24, but I had like a decade of reading Black Belt magazine and reading books and playing around with this and that. Um, some neighborhood boxing as a kid. We used to go up to my friend's house and cut his mother's clothesline down and loop it around four lawn chairs and make our boxing ring. And I wrestled a little in high school. And in the army, I did tiny bits of stuff. In Germany, I had a friend who'd spent the previous year in Korea. And he taught me basic stuff like a basic side kick, front kick, back fist, etc. And in Vietnam, I thought I was going to get some formal judo training because I had a guy in the orthopedic clinic, which is right next to our physical therapy clinic, who was pretty adept at judo. But we got about three, four lessons in and they shipped him off to Cameron Bay. Good for him. Not for me. Cameron <laughs> was beautiful. <laughs> Long Ben was not. But uh, yeah, that was about it. And then in, uh, I moved to New York in 1970 and in the summer of 72 i met iron man jan lang and also saw a couple of times of irish jimmy o'mare a friend of lang's and they were a couple of guys who were noted for being able to handle themselves on the street it's like unlike most tai chi people i did not get into tai chi because it was healthy and you could meditate and et cetera, et cetera. I knew these two guys that were good on the street that actually happened to do Tai Chi. So in January of 73, Jan started some lessons and I started training with him. And the first year was strictly with Jan. It was a little bizarre because we did Qigong, mostly standing and sparring. And that was about it. <laughs> some Qigong exercises, a lot of standing and a lot of sparring. And I kept bugging him. I wanted to learn the form. I wanted to learn the form. I wanted to learn the form. And the only internal form he knew he had been told by his teacher not to teach it. And it was a kind of guy he listened to. So he wasn't going to teach me a form. So a year in, he sent me to also study with Irish Jimmy O'Mara, who had Tai Chi training. And he'd done two years with William Chen, two years with Jengmin Jang, two years with Danan. And he taught the Cheng Min Cheng 38 short form along with, he's also the guy that originally introduced me to the concept of combining Chinese internal martial arts principles with Western boxing, because he's from an Irish boxing family. And he had recognized that the stuff that his father did fit the principles perfectly. And interesting story, as far as he knew, his father hadn't fought in years. He knew that his father was the light heavyweight champion of a huge tournament they had in England just before D-Day. Something to keep the guys busy while they're preparing for D-Day. And his father had actually taken a light heavyweight title, but he thought, you know, that was it. 
But Jimmy always wanted to be a fireman. His father had been a fireman for 30, 40 years and instructor for the fire department. And eventually he made it. In 1974, he got into the fire department and discovers that his father's engine company had had like a 25-year tradition of each new member had to have a fist fight with fighting Phil O'Mara, his father. And his father was famous for stuff like he had his own hose. The engine men do hoses, the ladder guys wreck stuff. And uh, he had his own hose, and no one was supposed to touch it except one kid that he was training to spell him when he was tired. And famous story, one day he's in a room that's burning up, and he's spraying his hose, and it's a tap on the shoulder, and he turns around, and some guy he never saw before says, give me your hose, old man. Phil was in his 50s by then. You're tired. And Phil looked at him and says, I know who you are. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> the guy goes, what do you mean get out of here? I'm here to spell you. <laughs> you're old. You're tired. Give me the hose. Phil says, I don't know who you are. You're not touching my hose. Get away from me. And the guy pulls the hose out of Phil's hands and Phil slugs him. You know, when the rest of the firemen got in there, the two of them are fist fighting, jumping over the hose because of course those brass nozzles will break your leg if they hit you. Well, the room is completely burning down. Um, so he discovered his father hadn't gotten quite as peaceful as he thought. <laughs> and Jimmy loved his fire department job. He was in a ladder company, one of the smaller guys in the ladder company. Like I said, the other guys that wreck stuff to stop the fire from moving along. And they claim like when they come up to a door, be all these big guys. And the captain would turn around and say, Igor, destroy. And they'd hand O'Mara the halogen tool and he'd walk up to the door and <laughs> And they were through it. <laughs> and he used to tell me how when they were tearing down a ceiling to keep the fire from getting in the ceiling, he'd take half the ceiling, the rest of the company would take the other half, and he would finish mm. first. And he used to say, just because they used their muscles, Frank, they're all like, <coughs> he's, I'm just swinging my weight. I shift forward, I hook, I shift back, I hook, I shift forward, I hook, I shift back, I hook, and I tear down my half the ceiling before they're done. And he really loved it. But then he got caught in the budget cuts of 1975. Mm -hmm. And no matter how good you were, last in, first out. So he lost his fireman job, broke his heart, and decided he was going to move to San Francisco. And I came home one day to find him sitting in my apartment, talking to my old lady at the time. And I walk in, he said, I'm moving to San Francisco. I'm like, oh. And then by that time, I was studying with B.P. Chan up at William Chen, they studying some with Jan, but a lot of it was with Jimmy. And he had this class. It was this free class for local people. You had to commit to it. Although I was glad that I did get in this cycle where he had a space. Actually, my old lady and I had hooked him up with this space. And it was different than the cycle before me. He taught in the park. And you could study for free, but you had to be there. And they were doing early mornings in the park. And he would have people to get in the class. You had to give him a key to your apartment. <laughs> and then he'd go to the first guy's apartment, open the door, walk in, rip the guy out of bed. And the two of them go to the next guy's apartment, open the door. And, you know, you, you had to go to class. I was glad that I was when that was already passed. <laughs> but I walk in that day to the apartment and he goes, OK, I'm moving to San Francisco. And I'm like, oh, and he goes, and you're going to take over the class. I'm like, Jimmy, I'm not ready to take over the class. I haven't quite even finished the form yet. He said, look. You're the only person I got. You've been assisting me since I started this class. And you're going to do it, period. These people don't have enough money to go up to Williams. So you're going to have to continue this free class for them. I said, but, but, but I haven't quite finished the form. Said, yes, that's why I'm going to be in your apartment every day for the next two weeks. and You will finish the form. <laughs> and we finished the form. He moved to San Francisco and suddenly I was a teacher. And... I taught that class for about a year. And then one day we're in the space that Lori and I had hooked him up with, which is an old radio station in Midtown, which they had done radio dramas. So they had this stage area and seating and whatnot for the dramas. And that's where we taught the class. And I'm looking around. There's one new guy. I don't know my regular people. I'm going, look, I've been and hearing some rumors that they're changing hands here. And the guy that hooked us up with this class isn't going to be here anymore. So I'm not sure how long we can be here. So if anybody has any idea where else we can be, 
And the new guy raised his hand. And I'm like, yes. He says, well, actually, I'm the new manager. I'm here to tell you your class is done. It's like, <laughs> so we <laughs> we ran class a little bit in an old friend of mine's wood shop, but that didn't work too well, working around the saws and whatnot. And uh, <laughs> and then the class kind of folded. And for a couple of years, I had a few private students and whatnot. And then my wife at the time, different than the old lady who'd gotten this place for Jim, um, my wife at the time and my two two private students start pushing me to start a class and pushing me to start a class. And then eventually I said, okay. And we started a class and I named the place the Wudong Physical Culture Association. And that was April of 1979. And it's been going along ever since then. Yeah. So you, you mentioned that uh, also in the, in the mid seventies, when you started teaching that class, um, they started training with uh, BP Chen. Can you, can you give folks a little bit of background on who he is as well? Well, B.B. Chan sort of came out of nowhere on us. Um, as it turns out, he had come from the Philippines, where he'd been living for years. He's originally from Fujian province, but his whole family had moved to the Philippines, I think, in the 30s to get away from the Japanese, but I'm not really sure. But of course, that didn't work too well, because the Japanese took the Philippines anyway. But... Uh, and he didn't like Japanese people at all. But uh, I mean, he's in the Philippines during the war. But Chan was came out of somewhat. We found out later he'd come to the United States by himself. He had two daughters here, and the rest of his kids and wife are still in the Philippines. And one of his daughters was a nurse upstate. So for the first year, he lived upstate with her. And then he uh, taught a little class in the basement of four or five nurses. And he decided to move to New York City and live with his other daughter. And he moved and she lived on 7th Avenue between 22nd and 23rd Street. And he got there and the first thing he said was, do you know of any, any Tai Chi schools in the area? He said, oh, yeah, right around the corner there's one. I don't know much about it, but there's this Tai Chi school right around the corner. And around the corner was William Chen's mm. 23rd Street studio. So he walks in. He starts, you know, talking to William. And all of a sudden, Williams discovers that this guy is like, he was like a walking martial arts encyclopedia. But his whole thing was he took humility almost to the point of being an egotist, like I'm humbler than you are. Like we could never call him a teacher mm -hmm. or we just practiced together. And But he was a walking martial arts encyclopedia. And Williams figured out, wait a minute, this guy knows a Chen style. He knows a lot of Qi Kung. He knows Bagua. He knows Xing Yi. He knows three Shaolin styles. And knowing William, that didn't then, but got to know William, I can see William's head going cha ching, cha ching. <laughs> it's like they said, yeah, sure, you can teach here. And the first thing he started teaching was Bagua Shan. And Bagua to us was this mysterious stuff that all we knew about it was there were two books. It was Robert Smith's book. And there was a Li Ying Arn book, which is mostly the reprint of Yen Ti Hua's 1930-something application book with all the drawings of the little fat guys doing the applications. And they were, were wonderful, but they were almost like hieroglyphs to us. And the Smith book didn't. Smith book had mostly the straight line drills of the Gaoi Shanks form because he hadn't studied that much, and that's what they started them with. And a little bit of circling in the back. So it's really this mysterious stuff that we knew something from these two books, so we knew we wanted it. And then in December of 74, Slick Tyrone, one of the guys from the neighborhood, was riding around his bicycle, seeing all the other Tai Chi guys. And uh, he rides up to Jan, and apparently the first words are, it's Bagua, man. It's Bagua. It's Bagua. William's going to have Bagua. <laughs> He's like, what? And it's like, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, He's got this guy, and he's going to start teaching Bagua next month. Jan's like, wow, check it out. So Jan went up and took the first six, eight weeks, whatever, a couple months of Bagua, checked the guy out, decided he was for real, decided he was really good. In fact, Jan studied with him continually right up until Chan's death in 2002. And, uh, and then... 
Jan Lang was the type of guy, like I said, when I wanted poems, he'd handed me off to Jimmy, no problem. Jan's the type of guy, he brought all of his students up to Mr. Chan's, anybody who could afford it. And we all went up and started studying Bagua with Mr. Chan. It was interesting when I got up there, Jimmy O'Mara was one of the students that started too, and he had never mentioned a word about it. <laughs> it's the difference <laughs> between those two guys. <laughs> the Iron Man was bringing his whole class and O'Mara wasn't mentioning it a bit. Um, so it's, it's a pretty interesting thing. And as it turns out, as Chan goes along, he starts teaching a Yang style long form. He opens up a, a Qigong class. He starts teaching Xing Yi. But it was interesting, when he first got there, Chan's great love was standing meditation. He said to William, I want to teach standing meditation. William said, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. <laughs> These Westerners are not going to stand. You make them stand, they quit. We have no money. We go out of business. You can't make them stand. And they go, all right. Well, he taught Bagua the way William told him to at first. He taught us, I don't know, 16, 20 weeks of Bagua. And it was nice. We had this whole form and we had this exercise set. And he said, well, that's it. That's Bagua. Come back, study something else. <laughs> and all the people that didn't know what was going on left. And Jan and his students, we formed a circle around him outside the office, a half semicircle with him against the office. And we said, uh, Mr. Chan, we know this isn't it. Said, what do you mean you know this isn't it? Said, we know this is a lifetime study, not a few weeks. Mm. He started to smile. And we said, and, you know, we want to really learn. We want to learn the deep stuff. And he said, well, what do you want? And the first thing we said was we want to stand. And he gets this grin from ear to ear. He's happy. He's got people asking him to stand. He said, what else? He said, we want to breathe. He says, oh, his grin gets even bigger. He says, anything else? And Jan, who is known as the Iron Man, did this Iron Body stuff with the teacher. But as we found out later, as a street fighter in Hell's Kitchen, as a kid, he was known as the Iron Man because you couldn't hurt it when you hit him. Mm. And Jan goes, we want you to hit us. I mean, B.P. Chan had the real deal Iron Palm, for Christ's sakes. The rest was, no, we don't want that. We don't want that. Don't listen to him. We don't, we don't want that. Nice. So then he hit us with the big question. He said, when do you want to do this? And we all knew the answer that would get us our class. <laughs> but we weren't really excited about it. I mean, this is 1975 with a bunch of hippie guys in the Lower East Side. And we've been, you know, we want to stand. We want to breathe. No, no, not this. And everyone suddenly goes, early morning, Mr. Chan. <laughs> He goes, yes, next Tuesday, 6 o'clock. And there was the beginning of this 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock serious Bagua training that we did for a few years, which was the first, was first half hour of every class. You came and you stood for 20 minutes in universal post. You turned to the side and you did a Bagua single leg Bagua stance. You turned to the other side, you did a single leg Bagua stance, five minutes each. That was the first half hour. Mm. Then you had an hour and a half to do the other stuff. And it's interesting. We had some relatively famous martial arts people come and take that class. And most of them didn't stay after they discovered what the first half hour was. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we were looking for. Yeah. And we became, so, you know, the mainstays. And we were in the studio for, I don't know, a year and a half, maybe two years. And then, I don't know what happened. But then we he started teaching. And uh, first he taught, he was living at that point in Stuyvesant Town. And first he taught in a little park in Stuyvesant Town. But then we got thrown out of there. <laughs> um, well, he was in, in his 50s, you know, and, and sometimes he had to pee. And without thinking, he'd run around behind his big tree and, and do his thing, except he didn't realize that there was like buildings all around with 10, 15 stories of people looking down at him. <laughs> He started calling the management. This, this Chinaman's peeing on the tree every day. It's like, <laughs> so we got thrown out of there, and we moved to Tompkins Square Park. Mm. And that's where he also started the leg stretching because they had the metal fences we could put our leg up on. And we started the tree training of hitting the tree. But here's this really interesting thing. He was into trees as living beings, which, of course, they absolutely are. 
And he was like, what's a strike for you is just a massage for the tree because the tree is much stronger than you are. So he had us pick one tree, which is our tree. And we were supposed to go up to it in the morning and, you know, say, hello, Mr. Tree, I'm here to massage you. And then we start, you know, hitting it with our palms and hitting it with our wrists. And, you know, so the tree made us stronger while we massaged our tree. <laughs> some interesting training. And like uh, you I, gotta, said, I gotta go with you that park one day. It's right next to my house. You gotta show me the trees that you worked on. <laughs> some some uh, Lower East Side martial arts history. Um, so so at the Wudang, when you guys started, um, you know, started the Wudang, what was the concept behind the Wudang? What were you trying to teach there that was different from other schools, or was it? you know, the same as other schools? Like, what, what What? was the initial thought process behind creating the Wudang? Well, the idea at that point, I had done, you know, Tai Chi and Qi Gong with Jan and Jimmy and Mr. Chan. And Bruce Francis had come to town for 76 for a year, and I'd done a little bit of pre Shingy and Shing Yi and Qi Gong with him. And Jimmy had introduced me to this idea of internalizing Western boxing, Mm. And I wanted to do everything. <laughs> I wanted to put it all together and have a place where we practiced all of it. And so that was the concept. And particularly, I wanted to get a bunch more sparring than most of the schools where Williams School had fighters. And they competed in tournaments, and they were really good. William himself, of course, famous Tai Chi fighter, probably the Tai Chi fighter of the modern era. But... uh I wanted to get more sparring in than we'd been doing in most of the schools. And I wanted to get different types of sparring in. We did sparring with Jan, but it was all empty hand. There's only so far we could go. And I wanted to introduce that internal boxing so we could actually bang a little bit with it. And we started working on a system where we were eventually, the system never really developed the way it was supposed to, but eventually it was supposed to go from boxing to kickboxing to grappling your self-defense to weapons. And the idea was each weapon that comes about, comes about because it's supposed to be practical in the time when the system was put together. Mm. So in 1979 in New York, the Wudong Physical Culture Association weapons were supposed to be knife, short stick, and garrison belt. <laughs> practical <laughs> weapons for the time and place. Um, and like I said, we only got so far, we did pretty well with the boxing kickboxing we did when we had tournaments coming up and got okay with that and at one point we had a grappling coach come in who was a lot of stories about dangerous doug westlake was an amazing amazing grappler and then also in 84 we had a boxing coach come in who turned out in the long run to be like my boxing coach my mentor my best friend amazing amazing guy but he was into boxing i mean one of the standard things in his class if he caught you doing martin he'd be yelling well this kung fu shit this is my classical boxing class it's like, <laughs> he was hilarious he's a great guy really good guy Vern the bulldog williams and he also he did the interview series where he did a boxing interview series called bulldog williams boxing's best friend where he interviewed big time boxers he used to get them to come in his very first interview was with Willie Pep, the greatest defensive fighter that ever lived, featherweight champ, 1940s and uh, into the 50s. And he knew Willie from when he was training as a kid in Massachusetts. Well, he used to sometimes come from Connecticut up to his gym because he knew a couple of trainers and help him train. And he remembered him. But uh, talk about a great interview. It opens up. With before Vern can say anything, Willie's like, "Hey, bulldog, how you doing?" He's like, "I'm okay, Willie. I'm okay. How are you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> and Willie answers with one of the classic lines of all times: says, "I'm doing great, bulldog. I'm doing great. I got a TV and a wife, and they're both waking." <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the whole idea was to mix everything. We were doing some pretty classical Tai Chi. Uh, I was teaching both Omera's Tai Chi and Chan's Tai Chi. And Chan had done, I did Chan's Yang style, and he did both 
um, a long form. And he did a variation of the 24 posture, which is pretty amazing. It showed you how those things were put together. Because everybody's like, oh, wushu, blah, blah, blah. Um, the 24 posture, the most common um, Tai Chi form in the world. And Chan didn't know anything about it. Chan left China before they created that. Mm. And at one point, William said, well, we could use another short form. Why don't you teach the 24? Chan said, 24? I was there when they did that. And William said, look. Here's the 24 postures. Take them out of your long form. Put them together. And he did. And it was this close to the regular one from the People's Republic, showing you that that's what they did. They took the long form and just cut it down because there was maybe mm. two or three places of minor adaptations. But generally, it was the exact same form as they did in the People's Republic, and he had never even seen that. He just took the postures out of his long form and put them together in that order. So we were doing that. We were doing his Bagua. He had a great Bagua system, but it was kind of strange. And we did this little form that almost nobody had ever seen before or since. And what happened was he was a Jenrung Zhao school, Bagua guy. And the Jenrung Zhao school has their basic form that they call the original form. And actually in China these days, it's taught as Xin Bajang, because you learn the Lao Bajang from their school, old eight palms. And then they took what they call the original form and called it the new eight palm, Shin Bai Zhang. And that was his main form. But mm. when he started in 75, he discovered that there was an old guy in Chinatown with four or five students teaching it. And the way he was taught, he wasn't going to teach anything that anyone else was teaching in the same city. So he took this subsidiary form from their school called the Dragon Claw Set of Chung Yu Lung which theoretically Chen Tinghua had created for his son. And he taught us that. It's really a nice little form, but it's really slightly strange and really rare. I've never seen anyone else mm. teach it. But he gave us that. He gave us a two-person set, which matches it perfectly. He gave us um, a 10 exercise set, which started out being known as the 10 Bagua exercises. And then when he started teaching Qigong, it transformed into being the Tao 10, but the same 10 exercises. And, uh, and then he had his meditation form. But put them together, we had this whole little system of Bagua. And that was the Bagua that I did for my first 14 years of Bagua training. And then he taught Hubei Sheng Yi, in which we did the five elements in complete detail. We did them in postures we did them in standing hand techniques we did them in straight line drills we did them in two linking forms mm. um and then he taught at a certain point he taught the animals but he taught them kind of roughly i never got that many animals from him but i did some of his animals very cool but uh, i do and then we did his his qigong which was a lot of standing his standing postures the Dao Ten, he had a set he called the Eight Qigong, various things. And so there was all of that that we had done, and then Omer's stuff and sparring stuff from Jan, and, and then uh, had another Qigong set that came from Bruce that we learned as the Tai Chi exercises. And over the years, that's become known as opening the energy gates of your body. And... Uh, <laughs> And it's kind of interesting. I think most of the students that he has now think that he learned it from his main really, really cool teacher in China, Liu Hongjia. But I happened to learn that set from him six years before he met Liu Hongjia. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's all the great stuff that he got from Liu Hongjia, which he really did. It's a really tremendous person, evidently. But uh, that wasn't one of them. Yeah. But so that's we're teaching that. I had a horse stance set that I learned from O'Mara which he picked up somewhere between Don An and William Chen and then modified himself. And that was an incredible one because it builds your body heat like crazy. So when we first got our studio, there was absolutely no heat. So in the winter, we'd go in <laughs> and we would do this horse stand set for 20 minutes. And that would keep us warm for the next hour and a half of training. Then we'd go home. <laughs> yep. So, uh, you know, as, as the Wudang started developing... You and as you, it sounds like you continue to meld 
this these Chinese internal martial arts with kind of the the Western fighting, Western boxing. Was it was that a conflict or was it an easy meld? What did you know? Wh why did you feel the need to combine uh, those different kind of systems? Well, I wasn't combining techniques. I was using putting the internal principles right. into boxing and the internal principles into grappling. The whole idea is internal and external are two different methods of developing power. And external power is basic athletic training, muscular contraction for strength, aerobics for stamina, repetitive hand-eye coordination drill to develop unconscious reflexive action for speed, athletic training. Internal replaces this with mind intent, weight momentum, and a pumping of the bodily fluids for strength, relaxation and diaphragmatic breathing for stamina. Whenever possible, speed is replaced with timing and positioning. What speed there is is a byproduct of the relaxation, mm. and there is no unconscious action. Everything is supposed to be conscious action. So two different methods of developing power. And then, of course, it's good not to mix them with hard and soft. With like a lot of people think internal and soft are the same, external and hard. No, no. Internal and external are how you develop power. Hard and soft are how you deal with force or power thrust against you. Mm. So hard is my force meets your force head on and overcomes it. Soft is give before force and come back where there is no force against you. Tai Chi is primarily soft. Ching Yi is exclusively hard. And Bagua switches between hard and soft, sometimes in milliseconds and sometimes in waves. But all three of them use internal power development. So we were applying internal power development to our Western boxing, basic kickboxing, and the grappling. So for like the boxing, could you give us an example of how those uh, internal principles like played out in Western boxing? Which I'm sure a lot of our viewers are familiar with Western boxing, right? If you're in the U.S., you've seen boxing over the years. How, how did it uh, transfer over those principles? Well, before I do that, i got to point out that internal is not just some secret of the Chinese. Some people do internal naturally. They don't even necessarily know they're doing it, but they do internal naturally. And then O'Mara taught me this really great thing. He said, if you want to see internal power, you find some guy over the age of 70 who does physical labor and is still doing an eight-hour workday. The body That's generally right. won't do eight hours of muscle work over the age of 70. So these guys have internalized their work, mm -hmm. basically by trying to figure out how they could get the most work done and go home the least tired through trial and error over the decades of doing the job. They've internalized their work. So it is a natural phenomenon. And certain athletes, I'm convinced that Sugar Ray Robinson naturally boxed internally. You know, I know crap about basketball and don't want to, but a friend of mine is a huge fan, swears up and down that Michael Jordan was internal. Mm. Don't ask me, but that's what he says. Um, you know, certain people are just naturally internal. So the whole concept is there is no conscious tightening of the muscles. Now, a lot of Tai Chi people get this mixed up and go, well, you never tighten your muscles. Well, if you never tighten your muscles, you never move. If you didn't have muscles, you'd be a jellyfish on a stick. But the idea is you never consciously tighten your muscles. You never consciously, you let the subconscious take care of it. And the subconscious will tighten the muscles exactly enough to be the most efficient. It's like guys can hurt you with tight punches, but they're never as loose, snappy, and actually do as much damage as loose punches. Well, the problem is with a tight punch is when you tighten the extensors, you also tighten the retractors, which are dragging back on that punch. Whereas when your mind just tells your fist, go to this guy's face as quickly as possible, it just tenses the extensors and doesn't have the retractors pulling back on it. So it's that kind of stuff. And trying to learn to breathe with your diaphragm so that you're getting efficiently oxygenated. And again, not a huge secret of the Chinese internal martial arts. It's pulling down the diaphragm, which you need to do to open up the bottom third of the lungs. You don't even use the bottom third of your lungs if you don't engage your diaphragm 
Well, as such, it's exactly how everybody that needs extra oxygen learns to breathe. That's the way they teach opera singers how to breathe. That's the way they teach horn players how to breathe. It's not like a huge secret, secret thing of Chinese martial arts. It's just efficient breathing. And then there's a the whole thing of conscious movement as opposed to unconscious reflexive action. And, of course, the unconscious reflexive action guys tell them that, well, it'll always be faster that way than conscious action. And the whole thing is, no, you have to keep in mind that you have to be in the moment, every moment. I've often said contact fighting is the best be here now meditation that there is. Because mm. it's the one that will remind you when you're not being here now most quickly and more graphically than any other form of be here now. Yes, any That's other right. form of be here now meditation. So this whole conscious action thing is you have to think, but you have to think as you do it. You have to realize that Thinking before is in the future, not in the moment. It's not it. Planning ahead like chess doesn't work that way. You have to just think as you do it, as opposed to do it and there's no thought involved. Mm. Like one of my exercises that I like is I'll have guys spar and then afterwards ask them what they did. And have people watching and have them compare what the people watching saw as opposed to what they do. And if they're still fighting completely unconsciously, they'll go, uh, I'm not sure. You know, I hate it. I'm not. Whereas if they're in conscious action, they know what happened. So it's a matter of working the principles. Mm. The principles are grappling coach, Dangerous Doug, was a character. But when he moved out to California, just to get to this one point, and he started his club, the Gentlemen Grapplers of San Clemente. He used to have them come in and do an hour of my early Qigong, which is pretty physical Qigong. The Dao Ten, the O'Mara horse stand sets, very physical Qigong. And then he would have them do a 45-minute intense no-break ab workout. <laughs> then they'd be exhausted. Mm -hmm. Then they would start to grapple. So the idea was that they weren't using strength, they were using technique. And they were using internals because they didn't have any external strength left. You know, it's it's a matter of applying the principles, not the techniques per se. Yeah, that makes total sense. And so for the after after training with Chen and, and um Francis and you know, for like the past fifteen years, what have, have you been doing with the Wudong? How have, you, how have you been advancing the training at the Wudong? Well, we're always trying to find what we can do new and try and adapt and work stuff out and, you know, adapt the self-defense to the situations. And as you know, I'm sure you figured out by now, in, internal forms are a continual process. Anybody that thinks they're going to get a form done and it's done, it's going to be in hard luck because your teacher can correct your form ad infinitum. I mean, I've been doing this stuff since 1975, and I go to China and I get corrected just like a beginner because it's always stuff that can be corrected all the time. And also part of what geared our things up was Tina hooking us up with the China scene. In 2003, we started training, and she hooked us up with a couple of the best martial artist in China, Li Bing Sir, Grand Master of Northern Wu style Tai Chi Chuan, and Liu Jing Ru, Grand Master of Chung style Bagua and Hubei Xing Yi. And Tina and I actually became formal disciples of the two of them. And we've brought groups to study with them 17 times now, I think. Yeah, for and, those who don't know who Tina is, Tina is, uh, is um, Frank's partner and also... Um, you know, one of the main instructors with the Wudang. So, so back in 2003, you started heading out there and, and training with some folks. Learning yes. anything new or just reinforcing stuff you already knew? Oh, all the forms are brand new. They're all completely stuff that we haven't seen before. Mm. And we're always getting stuff in. And Liu, uh, the Tai Chi is you do the Tai Chi, you do the Tai Chi sword, you get corrected over and over and over again. It's always corrections that can be made. You learn the push hands. Wu style has a couple of push hands techniques and differences that no other style does and whatnot. Bagwan has almost forms ad infinitum. 
<laughs> and Liu's always been really good. We show up and because with Tina translating, they don't speak English. We don't speak Chinese except for Tina. Without Tina, none of this would have happened at all. But through Tina, he was asked, you know, what do you want? She asked me, what do you want? And then he gives it to us. And so we've done a lot of stuff that way. By the way, I should remember, Tina's like our star. Um, Tina's the only person we ever had to win a national championship. Hmm. She took the women's Wu style Tai Chi title at the Wushu Union National Championship Tournament in Las Vegas in 2005, I think it was. She won the local tournament here in New York, and then she went to Atlantic City and won the regional tournament, and then she went out to Las Vegas and won the national tournament. And she also took silver medals in women's <laughs> Bagua, women's Wu uh, style, I think just sword in general, women's Tai Chi sword and women's other internal weapons with her deer horn knives. But I hope I don't get my ass kicked for saying this because it was a while before I had to see the medals before I went, what is that? So no, and I went, I said, women, this is silver medals. You got second place. And she looks at me and goes, second place is first loser. <laughs> uh. And Tina's the one that I've been playing around with this Bagua book, Whirling Circles of Bagua Zhang, for years. And she's like, let's get this finished and started pushing me and started translating stuff to help me out and writing the chapters on the basics and we we're about in the middle of that when a friend of mine who worked for a martial arts publishing company worked for North Atlantic Publishing and Blue Snake Books was their subdivision, came out and said, wow, you guys do Northern Wu style. No one's ever done a book in English on that. Why don't you do that immediately? So we stopped in the middle of the Bagua book and we did that and back and finished the Bagua book. But without Tina's pushing, who knows when that would have ever gotten finished. And, and then, uh, a couple of years ago, she decided to do a documentary on her dealings, her coming to America and her dealings with the Wudang. And she did this really great documentary, uh, Taiji Club. It's available at Amazon Prime. And she pushed, she got it in a couple of film festivals and placed and then got it on Amazon Prime, actually. And it's really good, really good. And she had yeah, never it. studied, she had never studied film. She studied as she went along. She did it off YouTube and going to classes at the Apple store over and over again. And it's as good a documentary as any documentary I've ever seen. And she's like all sort of on the job training, just doing it as she went along. So, yeah, she's something special. She's For sure. up, you know, upgraded our training and everything about the Wudang along the way. So when you're traveling to for the China trips, um, you take some students, right? Students are going with you from the Wudang, and what what do you think has is done for the school to be able to bring some of the students with you? Well, it's good. They get to experience China. They get to train in China. Um, we get to make our teachers really happy because we bring them people that pay to train, and it just works out all the way around. And uh, you know, they see this sightseeing. They'll go and they'll see the Templar Heaven and Tiananmen Square and the Great Wall and the ones that go over and over again like Jonathan's been gone with us like 15 times or whatever after a while you know everybody goes sightseeing Jonathan and I go find the craft beer places in <laughs> in Beijing where they're sightseeing but you know you get to do the, the sightseeing and whatnot and then recently we've done four times we actually went to uh, Wudang Mountain, that the club is named for, and trained with a young monk there that Tina and I met in uh, White Cloud Temple in Beijing. At one point, Tina had bought a bunch of people, went to the gift shop and bought various things, including complete monks' outfits. And then Tina went, well, we're going back to White Cloud, and I want to do some stuff in this outfit, and you're going to film it. I said, you're <laughs> going to wear a monk's outfit? And she said, they sold it to me, so they can't say anything. <laughs> so we're in this courtyard, and we're filming and whatnot, and all of a sudden this young monk walks out of the building there, and he starts talking to Tina and invites us in and starts telling her his story and how he's actually from Wudang Mountain and 
had lived on the mountain for years and years and done martial arts where the mountain is deep place to get the martial arts and the qigong but he wanted to get the intellectual aspects of Taoism and how White Cloud Temple was a place to do that. So he was there doing his studies for a Taoist degree at White Cloud, but that he would be going back to Wudang and invite us to come train with him sometime. So then about three years later, we did. Awesome. And we've been there for four trips to go and study with him. Really nice guy. Very nice guy. Monk Chen Li Sheng. Awesome. You know, we did Qigong with him for a couple of trips. We wanted to experience what their bago was like, so we went one time and did their single and double palm chains, the basis, and then the last time we went, we finally got what I was really after anyway and started training in the meditation, mm. which is was my goal, what I want to do, and what hopefully we'll get to go back and do some more of. And then along the way, we've you know taken side trips. We've been to Hong Kong a couple times, Shanghai three times or so. We went to Nanjing, went to Macau. Went to Xi'an, saw the terracotta warriors. You know, you're over there, so take advantage of it. And and that formal disciple uh, um, ceremony, what what is that like? Um, it's not such a big deal. You know, I have my own formal disciples that we do the baisher here. But it's kind of you read this thing where you swear loyalty to the teacher and loyalty to the style and the teacher says some stuff and you kowtow three times and you give them the guanxi red envelope and then you have the banquet, which can vary drastically. Like with Liu Jing Ru, the money involved was in the red envelope. And then the banquet was just us, Jonathan, our friend, Dr. Earl, him and four of his students. Whereas when we did the uh, Baishu with Li Bing Su, he, we didn't even have to give him a red envelope. We just had to cover the banquet. The party. And we, <laughs> and we had a number of our students do the Baishu with us just so we could cover the banquet. He invited pretty much everybody he knew in the martial arts scene to come to this banquet. It was covered. <laughs> and it was a wacky banquet because he was an old guy and he didn't want to do it in the evening. So we did a lunch banquet by sure. And we had done our Tai Chi class in the morning and we were supposed to still do our Bagua class after this banquet. And it's like the Baijo was flowing around and after a while, you know, you didn't really want to drink anymore. You're supposed to do Bagua that afternoon. But <laughs> when your new Taiji sisters show up at your table and they're all like between 60 and 80 and they're passing around the Baijo and want a toast, you can't exactly go no. So <laughs> class that afternoon was crazy. We all had to admit, <laughs> including Liu Jingru, that we had no idea what we'd done. And we had to start over again the next day. <laughs> but it was fun. Yeah. And those great people, really wonderful, wonderful people. Yeah, for sure. So, so this year, I mean, obviously, has been a whirlwind for everybody um, with the pandemic going on. How has it affected the Wudong? What have you done to adapt? Um, and you know, what what's training at the Wudong look like today? Well, we had to adapt massively because we couldn't. We'd been. For the previous eight years, we've been teaching out of this uh, Chinese medicine clinic, which came about when I had had my own place for 31 years. I had my place in the village on the corner of 2nd Avenue and Houston Street. And then they tore the place down and, you know, did this whole deal with this developer where we got places to live and whatnot. But we're supposed to get an in-house renovation from this um, homestead board which kind of screwed us and then to cover themselves they hooked us up with this developer who gave us places to live but i had this studio that i was in love with most people did anybody seen pictures if you watch taiji club you'll get to see pictures of it and see why we loved it but that had been gone for eight years already and we were teaching in this chinese medicine clinic and then a couple months in they wanted the rent that we couldn't teach there there's no way we could pay them rent and not even be teaching there. Right. So suddenly we were without a studio. But again, Tina came through, researched, and came up with this whole thing of Zoom classes. 
and we started teaching Zoom classes. And at first, I was like, oh, I don't know about internet classes. And uh, they actually turned out to work quite well. I got used to teaching them. We got a bunch of students. We do a lot of classes. Um, and then when the weather got good, we started adding a very few few students, of course, with the distancing and a mask and whatnot, classes in the backyard a couple nights a week. And we did this combination of Zoom classes and backyard classes. And when it gets cold again, we'll go back to doing just Zoom classes till it gets warm again. But it's worked out a lot better than I ever would have thought it would. And the internet classes are good. And of course, we've had students that have come in from out of town and done workshops and wish they could do more. And they're very happy to be able to do Zoom classes with us. And we're offering between the Zoom and the backyard or just the Zoom in the bad weather, we're offering about 20, 22 classes a week now. So. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, I was just going to say that you probably have a lot because I know a lot of people probably come to study with you for workshops and seminars and the China trips and they don't live in New York City. And this is a great way for them to uh, train with you. And of course, maintaining your current student base and giving them the training. So, I mean, you know, it's like the silver lining a little bit in all this uh, mess of the pandemic that you're able to continue to teach and also reach out to students in other cities and potentially different countries. Um, and and if people want to train with you, uh, we'll put the link in the show notes of this episode so people can find the information on how to access the Zoom, uh, the Zoom membership. And also, too, you have a bunch of um, videos and content on, on the Internet on Vimeo as well, right? Curated yes. by Tina, I think, right? Yes. Yeah, we've so got our YouTube got. channel and we've got our documentary and we've got a number of websites. Tina's good at setting up websites. <laughs> so, good. Uh, and uh, on our face sure. and our Facebook pages, we've got a Wudong page and a page for each of us. For sure. Yeah, we'll get that all in the show notes too. So people don't need to uh, memorize it. We'll get it down in the show notes and we'll link to everything. Um, and then on the next upcoming episodes, we're going to dig deeper into this discussion of the, di the different internal martial arts. Um, and we're going to be starting speaking about Bhagwajan, which we'll talk about in episode two of the Whirling Circles podcast. Um, but, you know, Frank, it's great to hear about you. We're going to hear more about you in the coming episodes and throughout the season. Um, and if people don't already get the sense of how much of a martial arts historian Frank is, uh, you'll definitely f see more of that in the coming, uh, coming episodes. Thanks so much, Frank. Sure. Thank you. All right, cool. So we'll be back next week uh, and we'll be talking about Bhagwajan. We'll see you then.